came up and said, would you like subtitles? No, I know. That's what it, I'm just saying. I haven't either. That's kind of funny. Hey, good morning, First Christian Church. It is so good to see you guys. And those of you who are at home, we're glad that you're watching as well. Um, hopefully when you walked in, you uh, grabbed one of these things. It's at our, it's our bulletin. Um, also, for those of you who still want to take the pre-made communion, that is back there. Uh, but we are also having the non-pre-made communion that's back there. So at the communion time, of course, when you feel comfortable, when you're ready, you can get up and go back and take uh, the house-made communion. Is that, uh, I don't know. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. All right. So um, uh, on the back of the bulletin, we've got some announcements. And uh, we're actually going to start having communion sign up. So it's not that hard. Uh, you can come in during the, the week or the weekend. Uh, you can make a tray uh, with the cup and you put some of uh, the uh, crackers in the other one. So that, and then make sure that you put it back there on Sunday mornings. And then afterwards, you just clean up afterwards. You clean up all that was not taken and whatever. So uh, it's not that hard. We're going to have a sign-up sheet down in the foyer. We can start that uh, next month. You know, so if someone would sign up for that, it doesn't take long. Um, also, uh, we are having a choir tonight. So that's going to be at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. We're having our study on eschatology. There is a tea party for Anna immediately after the service this morning. So that's going to meet down uh, in the, uh, I was going to say, my Sunday school, call, the fellowship hall. In the fellowship hall. All right, so that's where it's going to be. And next Sunday, or the 31st, we're having a potluck lunch, and there will be no Sunday evening service next Sunday. So bring a potluck dish with you when we, have, when we meet next week. I think that is all that I... Uh, oh, we're still looking for an education chair. So if you want to serve, if you want to help out, we're still looking for an education chair. So someone help organize the Sunday school and, and order materials and help find backup and, and teachers and so forth. So we are still looking for someone who is willing to do that. All right, that is all of the announcements that I have. So would you please stand as we have our opening prayer. Father God, we just turn to you and trust in you and believe in you. And I'm hoping that's how we live our lives. I'm hoping that every single day that, that we, we, we just do our very best to make sure that we are pleasing to you. Because we know, Father, that this whole life, it's not about us, it's about you. It's about doing what you need us to do so that we can say the things that we need to, we can do the things that we need to, uh, so that we can just bring you glory, honor. And so, Father, that is what we're supposed to live our lives like. And I know that on Sunday mornings when we come together as a family, when we come as brothers and sisters in Christ, we, we come to glorify Jesus. We come to glorify the Holy Spirit. We come to glorify uh, you, Father, so that everything that we do, all the songs that we sing, they're for you. And when we take the communion, it's to honor our brother Jesus for his death on the cross. And, and when we have our prayers, I, just, I, I hope that they're a fragrant offering to you, Father. I'm hoping that you're sitting on your throne and you're looking down at this at this building at, at First Christian Church here in West Point, and you look at all of us and you say, there are my babies. There are my children worshiping me and honoring me. And Father, I'm hoping that we do that. But Father, we've got to get to that point where we have that relationship with you, where we, we recognize that who you are and what you have done. We recognize that, that no matter what we do in life, you are our healer. You love us. You take care of us. You're there with us and encourage us. And you heal us. You heal us from our sins. You heal us from our, 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 our worries and our troubles. You heal us from everything that just brings us down so that we can just glorify you. 
Thank you, Father, for loving on us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you for just blessing us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
As we come together this morning to commune, I want to go back to 1 Corinthians and just read the words that are in the Bible. I think it says it as well as anything can be said. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. But then he went on to say, For whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then the, the next verse is really a warning that if your heart's not right, don't bring uh, problems on yourself. Get your heart right before you take the communion. Just open up, turn your prayers to the Lord, forgive me for all my sins. If there's specific things, tell him. But get your heart right. And then that way you'll be in, in communion spiritually as well as physically with him. Let's pray. Most gracious, kind, heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to come around your table. Ask the Lord that you will guide our minds and our hearts so that we can give up our selfish ways and our sin before we come to this table. Help us, Lord, to be able to get in common with you so that our heart is clear, our mind is clear, and that we can partake of this bread which was given as your body for our salvation and the blood that was given for our salvation. Lord, guide us and direct us in our thoughts and our minds. And therefore, Lord, in each and every day that we live. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May you go to the back if you need to.
what does the Christian faith have that so many religions around the world doesn't? It's the love we have for each other. It's the love that we share. We share with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We share with our communities that we even share with our people that don't like us very much, right? We have that love. So people should know that we're Christians by our love. We are one. Speaking of old, old hymns, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Jesus has lifted us out of sin. Jesus has lifted, lift, lifted us up out of sorrow. Jesus has list, lifted us out of bondage. He breaks all the chains for us. Jesus lifted me. Jesus lifted you. And he continues to do so today with the gift that he gave us on the cross. This hymn is on page 522 if you want to look in your hymn books. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. 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 Singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus lifted me. I was sinking down, and Jesus lifted me. I was sinking down, and Jesus lifted me. I was sinking down. Jesus lifted me, singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus lifted me, Satan had me bound, Jesus lifted me, Satan had me bound, Jesus lifted me, 
Satan had me bound. Jesus lifted me, singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me, and I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. And I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. And I'm so glad Jesus lifted me, singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Ms. Linda Lane is going to bring our special music this morning, and we're just going to turn over to Linda and let her come bless us. song just says, I owe you. Glad to be back. I'm not afraid to 
Uh, how am I supposed to, uh, <laughs> just, 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 just say, yeah, let's close in prayer, right? That's about, that's about it. Oh, well, Friday, Heather went shopping and she was up in, uh, Tupelo and I, I sent her a text and I asked her, I said, uh, Hey, doing good, question mark. And she said, doing good. At Mall Now, Barnes & Noble, the exchange pants. I go, don't know the exchange pants store, but sounds interesting. She was going to exchange pants there, not going. And then she goes, you are a dork. And I go, I know. And she goes, I love you, though. And I said, Whatever. Man, that's a great relationship, isn't it? It's fun. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. And I felt sad for Cameron because she goes, she was going back to college yesterday. She was going back a day early because she has an art project that's due early Monday morning. So she left yesterday. I said, hey, you're going on a date tonight? And she goes, no, I am not. Why? And I said, well, because you're leaving early. It's okay if you are, of course. And she goes, I don't want to be stuck in the rain on Sunday driving. I have an art project due on Monday that I need to finish. I feel bad for leaving early. I said, don't, don't feel bad. It's the things that we have to do as we grow up. And she goes, I know. Gave me a bad face. You know, so time to grow them up, time to get them out. Trying to mature the kids, Right? Yeah, I didn't mean that, Lewis, is for you guys. I'm just, I'm just saying that out loud. All right, so uh, we are in numbers this week. Um, hopefully that you read it all week. You, you finally got through. You were able to see what you needed to do. And we are in numbers. Uh, and uh, we're going to be on chapter 14. Numbers 14. And uh, so, what, catch you up a little bit about what just happened in Numbers. They, they had, they've been traveling from Egypt. They got, they got to the promised land. They sent out the team in there to find out what's going on and, and how they're going to attack and what their, the process is going to be. And they came back and all of them but one was given a bad report about what was happening over there. And so, uh, the Israelites, they, they, they get this report and then we get to see their reaction to what happened over there. So starting in chapter 14, starting in verse 1, it says, That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept loudly. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land? Only let us fall by the sword. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of uh, Jephna, were there also who had ex explored the land, tore their clothes, and said to the entire assembly, The land we possess, uh, passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and it will be given to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Let me tell you, there are times where you have to go through the hard places to get to the promised land. There are times where you're going to have to go in and face the giants, face the hardships that there in order to, for you finally to get to the place where you need to be. But here's the problem. Sometimes before you even get there, 
people are not going to be with you. Did you see what happened there? The first thing it said, they raised their voices and left, uh, and left in verse 2, and all the Israelites grumbled against them. They were grumbling. They were complaining. They, they hadn't even gotten in there yet. They were about to get into the promised land. They were about to get to where they needed to be and do what they needed to do, and the grumbling started. All they had to do was go in and take it. No. Oh, it would have been better for us if we had just died in the desert. Or maybe we should just go back to, let's go back to the way the things used to be instead of the way things are. And it's just, it's horrible. Why? 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 Right? We can relate this to our own personal lives. And we can relate it to the church. We can relate it both ways. God wants so much more for you. I'm referencing God because we're in the Old Testament today. But God wants so much more for you, and he needs to get you into that promised land, and he needs you. But, but there's too much grumbling going on. There's too much I'm not doing this kind of mentality. There's too much you can't make me change. You can't make me do this. You can't make me go into that promised land. You can't, and so we grumble to God. And as a church, we're... We're, we're still in the desert. We're about getting into the promised land. We're about ready to, to, to merge into those things, but then we have the grumblings. Why? Why are we grumbling? What are we complaining about? Oh, let's get on to this. Let's, let's figure this out. In verse 10. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to the tent of, uh, of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? Who's saying that? God. Right? God's saying that. How long are you going to fight me on this? How long are you going to treat me with contempt? How long are you going to question the things that I have in store for you that I know that are going to be good for you? How long are you going to treat me this way? Because he's saying it's not against Moses. It's not against Aaron. They're doing it against God. It's not against the leadership. It's against God. Then it goes on. How long were they refused to believe in me in spite of all the signs that I had performed among them? How long are you going to not believe in God even though he's doing miracle after miracle after miracle in your life? Then he goes on. I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought these people up and, uh, from among them, and they will be, tell the inhabitants of the land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people, and that you, Lord, have been uh, seen face to face, that your cloud stays with them, and, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put these people to the death, leaving them none alive, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land. He promised them an oath, so he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Here is the main point that I wanted to bring up today. This is what Father was talking to me about just, just the last couple of days. Did you see what Moses was saying to them? He, he was referring, he was like, listen, this is not about me. This is not about Moses. This is not about Aaron. And when you go back and you take a look at verse 13, it says, then the, then the Egyptians will hear about it. The inhabitants of Canaan, Israelites, uh, the land of Israel, the place that we're supposed to go to, all the Canaanites and all, all of them, they're going to hear about it what we did, how it reflects on you, God. That is what he's referring to. How does this look to the outside world? 
And that is what I feel too. And I'm talking about, about us. I'm talking about the church. I'm not just talking about First Christian Church. I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking about the whole body of Christ. I'm talking about all of this. How does it look to the outside world when we have division in the body? How does it look to them? How does it look when you have a megachurch pastor up in New York who just a few weeks ago found out that they were having, he was having affairs with people in the church? How does that look to the outside world? How does it look when we as a body start grumbling and complaining about the things that are going on? How does it look? to the outside world. How does it look when churches split over some of the dumbest things on the planet? How does that look to the outside world? When I was pre- my first church that I was preaching at was in Buford, Ohio. I mean, it's a I tell people when they were driving out to Buford, they were coming to visit me, I would tell them Here's how you get to where I'm at. You drive out 32, which is a highway coming from Cincinnati out that goes uh, east. I said, okay, you're going to drive on that. You're going to turn left on De La Palma. And on De La Palma Road, you're going to drive and you're going to drive. You'll finally come to a stop sign. At that stop sign, go straight. And after you've been driving straight on that road for a little while, you'll finally go over a little hill and then you're going to be in Buford. But it's going to take forever. You're going to think you've missed it. And every single person who would come, when they were driving out to see me, they would come and they were like, you're exactly right. I thought I'd missed the town and I went over that little hill and there was Buford. It was a town of 200 people. That's how many people were in the town of my first ministry. But there were three Christian churches within five miles. All running about 30 people, 50 people at the most. One of the churches split while I was there. And the reason they split is because someone brought a donut into the sanctuary and had it during the service. And they split over it. Pro-donut people, anti-donut people. Right? We split over some of the dumbest things. What does that have to do with anything? Who cares if they have a donut? Who cares if they are eating whatever? Who cares? They're in church. They're there. They're hopefully hearing the scriptures. But we have over the dumbest things. But then, how does it look to the outside world about God when we are gossiping? When we are complaining? When we are lying? When we are deceiving? When we are whatever. How does that look to the outside world about us? Moses is like, listen, it's not about me. It's not about Aaron. It's about you and what the appearance is to those out there. Yeah, but did you see that preacher on Sunday at First Christian Church? He had on jeans and sneakers. Oh! <gasps> You can't go to a church like that. They play modern Christian music and the piano with hymns. You can't go to a church like that. How does it look to the outside world? How we as Christians treat each other. And it has to stop. It has to stop. And he goes on. How's it going to look, Lord? How's it going to look, God? How's it going to look? It's not about this. He goes, it's not about this. Look at verse 17. Now the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, Forgive the sin of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they have left Egypt until now. 
You can gossip, you can lie, you can say all these things, you can rebel against what the things that God wants us to do, but there is a punishment for it. How in the world do we think that we can live in this world and have a walk with God without thinking that we're not going to get punished? Doesn't God punish his children that he loves? So the Egyptians, listen, you're going to be punished for this. Do you realize you're going to be punished for this? Do you realize the rebellion and the things and the, uh, how bad you're making God look? There's a punishment for this. But then he goes on. And the Lord replied, verse 20, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not only to those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised an oath to their ancestors. No one who has ever treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. So how, how do we get to that point where we aren't looking like we do to the outside world and making a fool of God? We gotta be like Caleb, right? What did Caleb do? How did he live his life? Wholeheartedly served the Lord. Not just on Sundays. Not just coming to church. Not coming to Sunday night. Not just when you're at home reading your Bible. Not just those times. Wholeheartedly. And this is where we have to ask ourselves the hard question. Are we serving the Lord wholeheartedly? Are you going to be called a Caleb when the time comes? Are you ready to stand up against the others that say, no, 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 we can't? And are you going to be the lone soldier who finally says, yes, we can? We can go into the promised land. We can go in there. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The, the defense is gone. God is with us. He's on our side. We can go in and we can do it. I will go. Are you going to be a Caleb? Or are you going to be like the rest and just grumble and complain? Rebel against God? Look at verse 25. Since the Amalekites uh, and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out towards the desert along the route to the Red Sea. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long would this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard their complaints and their grumble, uh, grumbling Israelites. So tell me, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In the wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who has counted in this, uh, the census, who has grumbled against me. Not one of you will enter the land I swore with an uplifting hand and make your home except Canaan, uh, Caleb, uh, son of Jepheth. And Joshua, son of Nun, as for your children that you said would uh, take as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in the wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here and for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies fly in the wilderness. Lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to, to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do those things to this whole wicked community which has banded together against me. They will meet uh, their end in the wilderness. Here they will die. And you look at the Israelites. What did they have to grumble against? Oh, we don't have any water. So Moses said, tap, tap, here's some water. We don't have anything to eat. Oh, manna falling from the sky for them to have. 
Oh, but we don't have any more water. Tap, tap. Here's some more water. Oh, but the promised land is hard. Oh, you guys, what are you complaining about? What are you grumbling about? God's got this. See, I, I don't like punishments. I don't think any of us really do. But I know that as I was growing up, I deserved every single one of them. My parents dished out those punishments to me, and I deserved them. The worst one that my mom ever did on a continual basis, let me just put it that way, was that wooden spoon with a hole in it. You guys know those? All right. My mom would spank me and my sister Stacy so many times with that wooden spoon with a hole in it, she would break them on us. And I knew, I got so used to it, and my sister and I did, we would fake cry and go in the next room and laugh. And my mom heard it. And she would come in there and just discipline us some more. I can't say beat us to death, you know, because that's just wrong nowadays. But she would discipline us more. She had to find new ways of disciplining us because we got used to the wooden spoon with a hole in the middle, right? She had to find new ways of doing it. It, it became apparent. My dad watches my sermons uh, during the week. And the worst punishment that you could ever give me my dad learned what that was. And it wasn't physical punishment. Physically punish me, go for it. But I remember very distinctly the time that my dad came to me in the basement when uh, uh, I was watching TV. And he looked at me and he said, I'm very disappointed in you. That was the worst punishment that you could ever give me. Disappointing my dad. If they had only figured that out, they would have saved money on wooden spoons. But you know, there are times when God is looking at us and he's doing this same exact thing. I'm very disappointed in you. Now I have to punish you. See, the thing is, you know better. We as a body of Christ know better. We know we don't need to talk the way that we do. We know that we don't have to act the way that we do. We know that we are supposed to treat each other in the body of Christ better than we do. We know this. And yet we still rebel against him. And when he punishes us, we go, what was that for? because of this it's because of this he's got a better plan for us he has a better plan for the body of Christ than just what it is it's moving forward it's, it's, it's being uh, a, a disciple it's, it's about doing the things that God wants us to Jesus when he was leaving he said listen there is, there's one real command I'm giving you that I need you to do I need you to, to grasp onto this I need you to hold on to this and, and he, when he was leaving he goes go and make disciples go and make disciples teaching them to obey everything that I have. You know, and he's, he's telling them, this is what we need to do. But why would someone want to come and be a part of a body when there's division? And I'm talking about the whole body of Christ, not just here. Why would we want to have people come? Why would we want to have that when, there's, when, when they experience the, the things that we say and do to each other? The whole body of Christ. Does that make sense? We have to do better. You have to do better. I have to do better. We have got to do better treating each other with love the way that we're supposed to. So we don't make God look bad. Because he does. We make him look bad. All right, I'm going to stop there for the day.
And I'm not continuing next week. Oh, next week. Deuteronomy. How excited are you for this? Deuteronomy is, is, is well, it's a lot like what we just, just did. But anyway, there's some new things in there. There's some important things in there. So this week, read Deuteronomy. Next week, I'm going to have the sermon on it so that we can go through it and figure out what God is trying to teach us. But guys, we've got to do better, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Did you hear what I'm saying? The body of Christ has to do better. And it starts with you. Uh, we're going to have our song of invitation. And uh, he lifted me. So if you need prayer, if you need anything at all, please come down as we sing this song. Let us stand as we sing, He Lifted Me. In loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. And from the depths of sin and shame, through grace He lifted me. From sinking sand, He lifted me. With tender hand, He lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh, praise His name, He lifted me. He called me long before I heard, before my sinful heart was stirred. But when I took him at his word, forgiven he lifted me. Then sinking sand, he lifted me. With tender hand, he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh, praise his name, he lifted me. Would you close with a prayer with me, please? Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for just loving on us and help, uh, helping us and being with us. And Father, I'm hoping that we, we've, we've grasped a little bit more out of, out of numbers and, and what we need to do to, to glorify you and to honor you. And, and Father, it's about, it's about that unity. It's about knowing that, Father, you are in charge. And when we just embrace that concept, embrace that mindset, and, and knowing that it's, it's all for you and, and everything that we do and everywhere we go, we should be... We should be working and striving to be that body that you wanted us to be. So, Father, I'm asking that you please just continue to grow us in you. Show us what we need to do. Because, Father, it's, it's, it's to honor you and to glorify you every day. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done. Thank you for blessing us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.